الحمد للہ رب العالمین و صلی اللہ وسلم علی نبی محمد و علی و صحبہ و سلم اما بعد ایو الاحباب کتنیو آن ان ار ستڈی اف شرح سنہ با امام با بحاری رحمہ اللہ تعالی which is a study of very important treaties uh, related to Islam and the creed of Islam, the Islamic uh, itiqad. And this is one of the reasons why uh, it is entitled Shara Sunnah and often the people, uh, when we translate it into the English language and pro possibly into other languages, it's all often uh, translated as uh, the creed. The explanation of the creed, and this is what our brother, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, bless him with genitor for a dose and forgive him of his mis mistakes and have mercy upon him. The brother uh, Don, uh, Donald Burbanks or uh, Abu Talha, rahmatullahi alayhi, who is, uh, was known as one of our brothers from Ahl Sunnah, and he translated and brought this Azim treatise to the English speaking audience. So it was by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the then the efforts of our brother uh, in, in, in striving to bring forth this great treatise to the English speaking audience by translating it. And so it is often entitled Shara Sunnah uh, or, or we translate it often as the Islamic Creed because the Salaf Rahimahullah Ta'ala used to uh, view the Sunnah as Imam Baba Hari began his treaties as all of Islam. That when they referred to the Sunnah, it referred to all of Islam, meaning creed, uh, the, the Aqidah, and meaning the menhaj or the methodology for understanding the creed, or as some of the ulama explain as the methodology of da'wah. So Islam uh, encompassed all that, and the Sunnah encompassed all that. And specifically so because Imam Baba Hari rahmatullah and many of the uh, early scholars from amongst the Salaf that when they wrote about the Sunnah like Imam Ahmed, Usul al-Sunnah that these books predominantly you could classify them as books as cre uh, of creed that they dealt predominantly with the creed of Ahl sunnah and Ahl sunnahs a mokif or mawakif with ahl bid'ah, their stance and position with regards to those people who had innovated in the religion of Islam and who had added new ideologies and new creeds and new methodologies, predominantly uh, creed and creed where they had made inhiraf and they had went astray and become deviated. So ahl sunnah at this, in those early generations, especially the uh, second generation, in Islam, after the, the generation of the Sahaba during the time of the Tabi'een, with Taba'a Tabi'een, those who followed them, then they began to uh, write books uh, affirming the creed of Ahl Sunnah and uh, refuting the, uh, the methodology and the uh, ideologies and creed of Ahl Bid'ah because Ahl Bid'ah began, you know, many new people began, be, uh, came into Islam as Islam. Uh, spread throughout other lands and not Arab uh, lands and so forth. So you had many different new people coming into Islam, many different people coming into Islam who uh, often were not grounded in the new religion of Islam, of course. So they required knowledge. And if they were non-Arab, uh, they required the Arabic language too. So it was, uh, it offered more opportunities for them to uh, make mistakes and go astray and this was the case and with that it became necessary when there began to spread bid'ah throughout many of the Muslim lands and so forth then it became necessary for Ahl Sunnah to clarify the creed and go back to the athar of the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala majma'een going back first and foremost to Kitab Allah wa Sunnah to Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then the athar of the Sahaba radiyallahu ta'ala majma'een to Affirm the creed of Ahl Sunnah. What does Ahl Sunnah believe with regards to Al Asma wa Sifat, with the divine names and attributes of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala? What did Ahl Sunnah believe regarding, uh, uh, of course, Tawhid al Rububiyya and Al Uluhiyya? But of course, in the early centuries of Islam, during the time of the Mu'allif, the author Imam Babahari, and before him, 
they generally, most of the sects, did not have issues and did not deviate so far with regards to uh, Rububiyah, the lordship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because even in this day and age, you'll find that Jews and Christians generally, they believe that Allah is one. They'll say, if you ask someone who is God, they'll say, Allah, uh, he's one. But what they mean by that and how they practice that is something else. So then what, uh, where they uh, go astray is with regards to al-uluhiyah, tawheed al-uluhiyah, the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. So instead they worship Jesus or they uh, add Jesus as a partner or what have you. But during the early times and during the time of Imam Babahari, rahmatullahi during the time of his writing of this treatise and before him, mainly most of the groups had went astray. You had the Khawarij who uh, made takfir or excommunicated other Muslims and decreed them to be apostates because of their uh, doing major sins. And they went against, they rebelled against the Khulafa, they killed Uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhu ajma'in radiallahu ta'ala anhu and Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu and they went against the Sahaba and made takfir of them. So because they believed they were not practicing the Sharia properly. So this was the Shubahat of the Khawarij. And then you had the Shia, those people who had went, uh, initially it started out with the uh, looking at the, uh, who should be rightly, uh, who should rightly inherit the Khalifa, you know, who should be the, the uh, Muslim leader, the rightful Muslim leader. And so it was a disagreement with regards to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu majma'een and Uthman. Uh, so there, this was, it was light to share in, in the beginning. But then it progressed to where they began to, uh, a group from amongst them were very extreme. So much so that they believed Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was uh, uh, Allah. Some of them believed uh, Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, you know, that Jibreel, uh, alayhi salatu salam made a mistake in delivering the risala and delivering the message that he made a mistake and that he not that he made a mistake but they say you have a, a taifa that we have here in the city that I'm living in right now presently you have a taifa uh, they're, they're predominantly not from this city but they're from another city in Saudi Arabia and when they pray at the end of their prayer they hit their legs like this and they say Khan 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 they say um uh, basically that he is deceived, deception, deception, deception. And they're referring to Jibreel alayhi salatu wasalam because they believe that Jibreel, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, that he, he listened to the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he delivered, you know, this revelation to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam that they believe that Jibreel was deceptive and that he was supposed to give it to Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu, but that in fact he gave it to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and this was deception. This is their, their creed, and this is kufr. This is uh, uh, disbelief in, in the religion of Islam. And we don't need to go into all the details about that, because our, our treaties, we're focusing on something else, but uh, we just want to have a little background about how these sects began to deviate, and, and, and the context of what Imam Barbahari was writing in. And so... Uh, then you also had the Qadriya, those people who uh, went astray with regard to the Qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Some of them, the Jab, uh, Jabiriya, uh, they believe that, uh, uh, that, that a person is forced for everything so that we're not really responsible. And that Allah, they, they believe that Allah uh, could not be possibly the most just and وَيَعَذِمْ بِاللَّهِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ أَفْقَارَ and that uh, you know we're forced to do what we do you know everything is the qadr of Allah so if you steal, if you drink wine, if you're a disbeliever or what have you, it's the qadr of Allah it's what Allah wrote for you and you uh, do not really need to do deeds and that you're not in control of your deeds so you're really not responsible and that would not be uh, just for Allah to punish you something similar to this this is what some of the, the, the extremists from amongst the Qadariya believe. And another group amongst them, they believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was, uh, uh, that his knowledge is not all encompassing, that he doesn't know, uh, you know, he doesn't have infinite uh, knowledge of all things. 
and that, uh, you know, the divine decree uh, that we are in full uh, control of what we, we do. And so they have various uh, forms of, of uh, deviation with regards to the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then some of the early, the, the groups that came after them, they mainly deviated with regards to al-asma'i wa sifat, with regards to the divine names and attributes. You had groups like the Jahamiya, who negate all of the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they believe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala almost, in fact, when you use their logic, that Allah doesn't exist because they believe he doesn't have any, uh, he, he doesn't have any sifat. So they don't believe he's the most merciful. They don't believe he is a Rahman, that he actually possesses that name. So they negate uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's divine names and attributes. Then you had the Mu'tazila, and you had the, uh, then later after them, the Asha'ira. And they also deviated with regards to divine names and uh, attributes. The Mu'tazila, they, degree, they deviated with regards to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's, uh, they believe, you know, they affirm the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the uh, sifat, the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they negate. They say Allah is, He is a Rahman, He is the most merciful, without mercy. He is a Rahim. Uh, the most beneficent without uh, mercy and without this, the actual attribute pertaining to that. He is our razak he is the provider and sustainer, but he doesn't provide. So this is uh, a little bit of uh, uh, a very concise uh, explanation of how those early sects, uh, they deviated. So it was really after the time, so this is what the Salaf, we're really dealing with, and this is why you'll find a lot of their treaties, like Shara Sunnah and Usul Sunnah by Imam Ahmed and many other uh, early scholars, that they, when they wrote, they mainly wrote with regards to Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat, and dealing with the Khawarij and the Qadariya and those early groups, in the in, in dealing with their Shubahat and where they deviated, and affirming Tawheed al Asma'i wa Sifat. Instead of Rububiyyah and uh, um, and Uluhiyah as much, you know, although they affirm those, of course, they find those in the early books of Creed, but their emphasis was on Al Asma'i wa Sifat and clarifying it because this is where the people in their time had went astray. So then the later generations it became, and that's why you have Sheikh Al Islam much later, Sheikh Al Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Al Qayyum, and many of the other scholars after him in. Uh, Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab here in the Jazirat al-Arab and so forth, that they began to write about. That's why we have Kitab al-Tawheed and books like this, because at their time, the people had went astray with regards to actually Rububiyyah and went astray with regards to uh, Al-Uluhiyyah, especially with uh, worship. You know, they began to say, yes, we believe la ilaha illallah uh, wa shadu anna Muhammad rasulullah but what it means is we can still supplicate to the dead. We can still make tawaf around graves and believe that those graves are going to benefit us. We can still, uh, you know, all, all the other practices. We can still put our weapons on the trees and, and seek barakah from the trees or barakah from our sheikhs living and dead, uh, whether it's from their najasa, from their inside, their intestinal fluids or their uh, their urine and their uh, defecation, we can seek barakah from this, billah. So these later people, they went astray with regards to actual acts of worship. So this is just giving us about a bit about the context of Imam Baba Hadi's uh, treaty. So now we'll try to be very concise and not uh, take too much of your time so that way we can get through the lesson and that we can benefit from this on the YouTube. The, this this daras is geared to be concise and so you could just be cooking your food and listen and hopefully gain some benefit. Qali Imam Baba Hari Rahimullah Ta'ala I'lam anna al-Islam huwa sunnah wa sunnatu hi al-Islam wa la yukum ahaduhuma illa bil-akhir fa min al-sunnah lazuma jama'ah wa man raghba ghayr al-jama'ah wa faraqaha faqad khala ribqat al-Islam min unakihi wa kana balin mudilla so as we already read this part, but now we're going to go into the uh, explanation by one of our great imams of this time, Rahmatullah Imam Ahmed al-Najmi, 
Rahmatullah, may Allah forgive him of his sins and bless him with genital firdos and have mercy upon him. Ameen, Ya Rabbil Alameen. So Imam Baba Hari said, uh, said in this part of the treaties, he said uh, that know that Islam is a sunnah and the sunnah is, is Islam and one of them cannot be established without the other. Uh, and whoever uh, and whoever has um, whoever desires other than the main group of the Muslims, the Jama'ah, and has divided them, has removed the yoke of Islam from around his neck, and he is misguided, and he misguides others. So this is uh, Imam Baba Hari making clear for us that the Islam is a sunnah, as we explained in the previous dars, and the sunnah is Islam. You can't separate the two. You can't say, I practice Islam, and you don't practice the sunnah, or you only take from the Quran. This is batal, this is complete falsehood, and a person who says this is either someone who is absolutely ignorant of Islam or they are a disbeliever in Islam, they are a disbeliever in the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and they need da'wah, they need da'wah. So I don't say that you should go make takfir on them, but they need da'wah because they've uttered a statement of kufr and it just depends on to what degree and what their understanding is with regards to the ahkam of takfir and again we leave this to the ulama, but these are statements of kufr if they deny the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi said about this ibara. So I, I went ahead and prepared this dars by translating some of the benefits from uh, Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi, his, his treaties. He said, with regards, he said, In al Islam, who is Sunnah, who is al Islam, kaifadalik, yani, and al Islam, haqiqi, who is Sunnah. So we'll, we'll, we'll go to the translation so that way we don't take your time with going through the Arabic. So, Sheikh Ahmed, he said, Islam is a sunnah and the sunnah is Islam. How is this? Meaning, real Islam is the sunnah. So whoever is steadfast upon the sunnah and practices it, then he is practicing Islam. Therefore, whoever inclines away from it, going to the left or to the right, then this person has strayed from real Islam due to his misguidance. However, know that going astray is of two types. So this is very imperative, and, and this is why it's beautiful to go to the explanations of the ulama, because they give you those principles, and they give you the categories, and show you that things are not always black and white. The way we deal with innovators is not always the same. Innovators are not all the same. They're not on the same level. Ahl sunnah is not the same. The ulama are not the same, uh, even in their level of knowledge. So what about the students of knowledge? What about the du'at? And what about the layperson? They all have different levels due to their knowledge and due to their practice and due to their uh, their uh, their fadl with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed, rahmatullah, he said, however, know that going astray is of two types. So he said that going astray is of two types. Letting us know, and this is something I want to make ten be of, because I, I recall when I was back in uh, in my locality, back in America, uh, speaking to one of our brothers, a brother from Ahl Sunnah, a brother who studies uh, and has zeal and, and has khair, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preserve him. But he has a, a misunderstanding about bid'ah, because he un, what he understood, and he said this on more than one occasion, he believes that when I say that someone's a mubtadi'ah, or that that the books refer to someone as a mubtadi'ah, that, that means they're a disbeliever, and that they're going to hell for sure. No, that's not what it means. And this is what Sheikh Yahya, uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed Najmi is explaining for us. He says, however, know that going astray is of two types. So even bid'ah, uh, bid'ah has two types. Bid'ah mukaffara wa bid'ah ghayr mukaffara. Bid'ah mukaffara means bid'ah, innovation that takes you out of the fold of Islam. And bid'ah ghayr mukaffara is bid'ah which the person has done or that the uh, person can be an innovator but still be a Muslim. They're still a Muslim. That doesn't mean they're, you can't, and that doesn't mean you cannot pray behind them. And that doesn't mean you can't act, eat their food. And that doesn't mean many, that you can't give them salams if, if uh, looking at the maslaha, the masale and mufasid in that issue. So you have to know, as, she, as uh, Imam Ahmed al-Najmi is saying, that, uh, that going astray is of two types. So then he says, number one, total deviation. He said, and the person who does this, apostates and he is judged as having left the fold of Islam completely. So this is a person who is totally deviated. They are a mubtadi'a doing uh, bid'ah mukaffara. This is bid'ah which takes you out of the fold of Islam. Meaning a person who supplicates to the dead, for example, believing that the dead, you know, oh my grandfather, 
או שייח סו-אנד-סו, שייח הבדואי, שייח סו-אנד-סו, the נקשבנדי טריקה, שייח סו-אנד-סו of the אחבאס, ג'מעת אל-אחבאס, עבדולאה אל-הררי, ועיאדם בלאה מדאליקה. May Allah protect us from this kufr, the shirk, and the zandaka, that this is kufr. This, these kind of acts, because they, are, they involve shirk, that these are bid'ah, mukaffara. These are bid'ah, innovations, that take you out of the fold of Islam, because they involve disbelief. They involve shirk al-akbar, which takes you out of the fold of Islam. Wa'iyadam billah min dhalika. Then he mentions... Rahmatullahi, partial deviation. The second type of deviation of going astray is partial deviation. He said here that partial deviation is the one who partially deviates, does not apostate, and is not judged with apostasy. So someone can be uh, an innovator, of course, and not be a disbeliever. So that doesn't mean you're an in, uh, innovator and a, uh, a disbeliever. is not synonymous. They don't mean the exact thing. No. Bid'ah means a person has fallen into innovation, and they have different levels. And a person can fall into innovation uh, that, is, that takes you out of the fold of Islam and can be judged by the uh, scholars to being a, a, a disbeliever because they have uh, bid'ah mukafra, like the goal of the Jahmiya. The Jahmiya in the early sects, Imam, not just Imam Ahmed, but the, the Salaf, made, had uh, consensus that the Jahmiya were disbelievers. Why? Because they said the Qur'an was created and that, uh, you know, going against the, the Qur'an, going against the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu and going against the Ijma of the Salaf of this Ummah, that the Qur'an is not, is ghayr makhluk, it's not created. And it's one of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala's divine sifat, that because it's the kalam of Allah, it's the speech of Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala, just like the original Torah and the original Injil, uh, the, the, the original Bible and the original Torah, they're the speech of Allah. They're kalam Allah. We say that that, that is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we believe in it and um, we uh, and we say that it's not created and that it's from his sifat and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks uh, as he subhanahu wa ta'ala when he wants, how he wants and he subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, that his speech is uh, his speech by his 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 uh, by uh, his qol and uh, his haruf was sot that by his by Allah subhanahu wa taala the the letters of the Quran and the letters of the original Torah and the red letters of the original Injil and the other books in which Allah subhanahu wa taala uh, which contain Allah subhanahu wa taala speech they are the the letters and the sound. Uh, the pronouncement of it is the Quran and is the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's what we believe. But those people who devi uh, deviated in this, like the Jahmiyyah, who negated this, that they have fallen into kuf, uh, uh, fallen into uh, kufr and they have fallen into bid'ah mukafra. Bid'ah, an innovation by taking this because no one before them said these statements that this is not the Qur'an or the Qur'an is created. No one before the Jahmiyyah uh, made these kind of, had this, had this new ideology. It wasn't with the Sahaba and it wasn't with the Tabi'een or the Itzba'a Tabi'een. They didn't, they didn't hear of these, this kind of bid'ah and they did, would never have accepted it and would have considered this, uh, the person who says this is zindik, that he, this is zandaka, this is, uh, this is heresy. So, that's why we have to know that bid'ah is of different levels as uh, Sheikh uh, um, uh, Ahmed al-Najmi said. So he said that the person has par partial deviation, that they do not leave the religion. And he says, however, his Islam is decreased to the extent he deviated. So to the degree that a person has deviated, they've fallen into bid'ah, that shows us ah, that bid'ah has different levels, that they, uh, their iman decreases by that level. And so he said his Islam is decreased because a lot of times, uh, this is a qaida, uh, this is a rule that you should, should learn. This is the ulama, they, they say that when you have uh, 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 Islam, wa iman, uh, that if they're mentioned in uh, the same text, in the same sentence or the same hadith or what have you, then it lets us know the meaning is different. Either either ijtama'at tafaraqat al-ma'na. We either 
تفرقت اجتمعت so basically that if the uh, if you hear iman and islam mentioned in a text in the quran or the sunnah or statements of the salaf that when it's mentioned islam uh, together then their meaning is different then then iman here has a more has a more uh, a more specific meaning meaning related to the arkan of islam i mean arkan of iman uh, the pillars of iman and things like this relating to the usul of iman and and that it go it fluctuates and and, and decreases it 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 uh, it rises with uh, obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and it decreases with disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that uh, when those words, Islam and Iman, are mentioned uh, separately in the text, that their meaning is the same. And that's why uh, Sheikh Ahmed uh, Najmi, uh, when he said, however, his Islam is decreased to the extent he deviated. So meaning here the meaning, Islam, when he mentioned it here, it also is referring to Iman. That your Islam and your Iman has decreased, it has went down to the extent of your deviation, to the extent of the bid'ah that you, fought, you fell into. And what is the evidence for what we've claimed? Then he said, what is the evidence for what we've claimed? He said, the evidence is the hadith about dividing in which the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if tarakat al-yahud ala itta wa sab'in firqa, wa if tarakat al-nasara ala thnatayn wa sab'in firqa, wa sa taftariku hadhi umma ala thalatha wa sab'in firqa, kullaha fin nara la wahida, kulla man hiya ya rasulullah, kala man kana ala mithli wa ma kana alayhi wa sahabi. So he mentioned the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He said that this is evidence for what he's saying, that Iman has fluctuates with this bid'ah. He said the Jews broke into, or that people can be partially deviated. He said the Jews broke into 71 sects, the Christian broke into 72 sects, and my nation will divide into 73 sects, all of them in the fire except one. It was said, who are they, Ya Rasulullah ﷺ? He said, uh... And then uh, uh, Sheikh Ahmed mentioned his own statement before he finished the hadith. He said, who is that one group and who are they that will be saved? Who are they who will be saved from the hellfire? And then he said, the Prophet wasallam said, they are those who are upon what I am upon and my companions are upon. So meaning we have to be upon the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam. Ru'ahu Abu Dawood wa sunnah al-arba. Uh, so then he said, Sheikh uh, Yahya, Sheikh Ahmed, Rahmatullah, I don't know why I have Sheikh Yahya uh, on my, my, my tongue here, but uh, Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi, Rahmatullah, he said, Then you should know that the threat of the punishment in the fire for all of the other sects does not mean they will be in the hellfire forever. So this was the purpose of mentioning this hadith and showing that and, and how it is evidence uh, for partial deviation. So listen closely. Why is this hadith evidence that people partially, de that a person, uh, that deviation could be sometimes, uh, even though a person falls into bid'ah, that they are not out of the fold of Islam, that it's partial deviation. How does this hadith support that this that a person could be partially deviated. So he's saying, then you should know that the threat of punishment in the fire for all the other sects does not mean they will be in the hellfire forever. So that doesn't mean there will be Khalid, uh, finnar, Khalidin finnar. It doesn't mean that the people who fall into bid'ah and those 73 sects that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in that hadith, that they're going to be in the hellfire forever. That's not the meaning of the hadith. And that's what many of the ulama explain this hadith. Although there's a taifa from the ulama who say that say otherwise. But uh, if I recall, most of the ulama, and this is also the statement of uh, Sheikh Ahmed al-Najmi, that it does not mean that they will be in the hellfire forever. And he said, who, however, whoever differs with what the Messenger وسلم, came with and what he and his companions were upon, either differs to the extent it necessitates apostasy uh, and leaving Islam, then this one will be in the hellfire forever. So whoever has partial deviation 
and remains upon Islam, then he is promised, then he is promised with the fire. He hopes that he will be from the monotheists, monotheists who desire to be from those who will be removed from the fire, as it was affirmed in the hadith uh, regarding uh, intercession, in which Allah the Most Majestic will take out those who die upon Tawheed and from the hellfire as long as they possess something from faith, even if it was minuscule. So just to clarify that statement in case the translation wasn't clear, is that he's saying that this hadith shows us that a person can be a muqtadi'a, they can be misguided and be an innovator, fall into deviation, but of course they're still a Muslim. They still have many of the rights of a Muslim, unless of course there's those other ahkam pertaining and, and there's benefit in not giving them salams, or the, if there's benefit in not sitting, uh, not sitting with them, and not giving, uh, you know, making hajr of them, and all this you have to look at the masada and the mufasid. Is it going to be beneficial? And we mentioned this in our study of the treaties of uh, Sheikh Abdul Masin Al Abad Al Lama, Hafizahullah Taala. We mentioned that, and we mentioned that in many of our lectures. So we don't need to continually uh, mention the same masada over and over all the time. So. Uh, letting us know that uh, a person can partially deviate and be a mubtadi'a, but they're still a Muslim. And they are promised the hellfire. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Kulluha fin nar ila wahida. That they'll all be in the hellfire except one. You know, except for those who are following his sunnah, meaning they haven't deviated. They're not on bid'ah. And so letting us know that although those people will be in the fire, they're not in the fire for, for forever, if, as long as they're a person of tawheed, they're a person of, uh, they're a monotheist. They're a monotheist, that they believe in that Allah is one, and He's the only one worthy of worship. Although they fell into some bid'ah, maybe they fell into some bid'ah even related to Tawheed, but it didn't take them out of the fold of Islam. Okay? The point is, is that they still are Muslim, but they have an innovator. So an innovator uh, is of two types, as uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed al-Najmi said, an innovator is of two types. One who is totally deviated and left the fold of Islam, this person will be in the hellfire forever because of their bid'ah. Their bid'ah is bid'ah mukaffara. And then there's bid'ah, ghayr mukaffara, where a person has, bid, has fallen into bid'ah and deviated, but they are still a Muslim. And they will not be in the hellfire forever as long as they are a monotheist. And according to the ahadith of the Prophet wasallam, referring to shifa'ah, that they will... Uh, you know, be interceded for by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala if he chooses to punish those people then they will be punished but they will be purified for the fi by the fire and then they will come out of the hellfire and enter paradise and may Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala bless us to be of those who enter paradise without any punishment Ameen Ya Rabbil Alameen so we will stop there so because we have went long in our treaties and we'll continue on with some of the Ta'liqat uh, or explanation from Sheikh Ahmed al Najmi in our next sitting. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy upon us and forgive us of our sins. Anything I said that was correct was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anything I said that was incorrect was from myself and the Shaytan.